a beautiful lady here that I call my wife uh, had never played the piano much at all other than banging on it as she, when she was a kid and never sang in front of no one. As of a year ago, she taught herself with God's help to play the piano. And you know, I just see it. I just see it getting better and better. And she has the same problem that we all do. She has a little bit of lack of confidence sometimes, but uh, as long as you're singing for Jesus, right. and you give it all you got. If you give it all you got. Now there's some, and I'll go ahead and raise my hand, that probably should keep the mic away from their mouth, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to be mean, but uh, but anyway, I won't get into that. It's good to be here today. It's good to be here with you all. Praise God. I just wanna I just wanna make this quick uh, little praise report. As of Friday, this coming Friday, uh, my wife and I will be going to the title agency to sign on our church. Amen. <laughs> Now, the, the sellers, which is the UMC, the Houston Valley, I believe it's called, United Methodist Conference, uh, that we're buying the church from, they can't come uh, and sign, and I don't think they're going to come, physically come anyway. I think they're going to do it on, what they call that, uh, Zoom. Yeah, electronically, Zoom or something. But anyway... They're going to do it on there because they're all the way down in Knoxville, Tennessee. But they won't be able to do their part till the 12th. So it just, the devil just keeps prolonging it. You know, and I don't know if I want to give him credit for prolonging it or not. You know, I, I sometimes feel like it's God's timing. And uh, he has a reason for it to wait until, until it does. But sometime around the 12th or 13th, it's been so agonizing because we haven't, uh, we've only been in the church twice. Once together, and the second time, Burgundy was at work, and she couldn't, she wasn't there. But I've only been in the church twice, myself, Burgundy once. And uh, so we go out there, and ever since February, and bless our poor little hearts, we go out there, and we, we just look around. We just walk around the premises, and walk up and down the steps, lay our hands on the doorways, and pray, and, and, uh, and look through the windows like a bunch of kids looking at toys they can't have inside of a store and uh, that's all we've been able to do but finally after the 12th we're going to get that old key in our hand we're going to be able to walk right in there and start anointing it with oil we got a man the basement has a little bit of a mold issue and i was afraid to say that at first because i didn't want people to not come because of it and there will be people watching this that you know has potential to possibly come that live down our way uh, but I want to announce that not long after we get a key to it and it becomes ours, that we got a man hired. He does it for a living. The name of his company is Astrid Environmental Services, and he'll come in there and they put on suits and masks and everything, and they'll totally gut the basement. They'll take the paneling out, the drop ceiling out, and they'll rid that basement of, of mold. So yeah. it's not cheap. It's not cheap by no means, but... Uh, God has provided for us a way to take care of it and financially, and I pray give him all the praise for that. So now that that's out of the way, I think um, I think Pastor Vic is coming back today. Is that correct? They're, they should be in port because I've been seeing them online. Okay, so they're they're back in, among the living, so to speak, and um, so y'all will have y'all's pastor back here, I guess, Tuesday night. And um, and uh, I, I just thank the Lord for Pastor Vic and Sister Mary, and I know y'all appreciate them very much. And I uh, thank God that they back their back. Let's just pray that from the port home all the way to home that they'll be safe. And I think it would be okay to go ahead and 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 give God thanks for getting them home safe Amen. because we thank we thank Him in advance for what He's going to do. So, but if you have your Bibles today, I want you to be turning, if you would, to the Book of John. First chapter of John. We're going to be reading. We're going to be reading a familiar scripture, and um, today's today's sermon is not only going to be different for you all, but it's a little different for me because I have a notebook up here with me today. But God didn't give me a whole lot of a whole lot of notes. I do have some things I'm going to read read about. And if you don't mind, as you're turning to the book of John. 
uh, when I read this scripture, um, I want you all to keep in mind that song that Burgundy just sang. There is nothing better than Jesus Christ. And I want you to keep that in mind today. That's not the title of my, my sermon, although that would be a pretty good title. I'll, I'll give the title to the sermon here in just a moment. Uh, but um, there's nothing, there is nothing more important and there's nothing better than Jesus Christ. So if you found the book of John, I just want to read a few quick uh, short um, uh, scriptures here. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the mighty and the most holy name of your Son, Jesus. God, we lift him up today because there's no one else to lift up. God, we lift him up today because he is, the, he is, he is worthy of all praise. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that's uh, able to come and be with us today. And I ask you to send your Holy Spirit for this handful of people that's here today. But that's okay. God, you're still here. There's someone going to be listening that this scripture, this, this sermon with these scriptures are going to speak to. We ask you to be with all the prayer requests today, the ones that you heard, the ones that are that are sick. We got ones, some that are there now, church family, brothers and sisters, that are there at the hospital now, God. We ask your power to come upon them, your healing power. And God, we ask you this the only way that we can. Let the teacher and the preacher come. And God, it will never fail to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I was preparing for this sermon last night, God don't ever, he don't ever really start to deal with me um, until a day or so before I'm due to preach. And that used to get me a little bit scared, uh, a little bit panicked, a little bit worried. But it don't anymore because I think he knows us. Somebody knows he knows us better than we know ourselves. And he knows if he gives me too long to think about it, I'll either, it'll either leave my mind or, or I'll just get too much going in my mind. But as yesterday, I came in and I sat down. And as Burgundy was, we'd all been out working all day. And we was at the church actually doing some things. And the girls, they had a busy day yesterday with their great-grandmother. They stayed a few hours with her, Burgundy's grandmother. And we all were probably pretty tired, of course, but as I sat down to, to start reading and, and God was dealing with me with this sermon, I started getting so, so sorrowful in my heart that my family thought at first that I was just tired because they looked and I hadn't got into the Word but maybe ten minutes and an overwhelming sorrowness came into my heart to where I couldn't stand it any longer. And I, I went and laid down on the bed. And I didn't lay there because I was necessarily tired, although I was. I laid there because the sorrowness for what I start, God started dealing with me on was so strong that I couldn't hold it back. And that sorrowness about, was about this, was about how we walk through life and and. and and, and we don't give Christ enough time. We don't think of Christ in a way that He is our our ultimate guide. He is our ultimate. Um, he is our ultimate teacher. Amen. He is our ultimate man. That at the first the first Adam, so to speak, fell at being. He is our ultimate everything. And I see people. And I won't go into detail on who I kind of, God started dealing with me with this sermon about, but I see so many people that are worried and they're so self-absorbed self in their daily activity and their daily life that Christ never enters their mind. We're talking about Jesus Christ here. Let's break this down and let's give him credit because he deserves all credit. Amen. We're talking about the man that gave up everything that he ever had in heaven 
Not forever, but he gave it up momentarily for 33 and a half years to be exact. He gave that up to be to come down here to be an example for us all. And he and, and, and you don't understand because we haven't seen it yet, but we don't quite comprehend just what he gave up. He gave up all of heaven to come be with us mm -hmm. and to be our example. Now everybody knows that heaven is great. We've all read it. We all have that. We all have that feeling inside of us that heaven is great. But we have, none of us sitting here has seen heaven yet. But it's the greatest. It's going to be the greatest place that we've ever seen. But what makes heaven great is Jesus Christ. Amen. What makes Christianity great and awesome is Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'll never be able to bring out the sorrowness in you all that I felt yesterday. Probably not. And that don't mean that God's dealt with me in a way that he would not deal with you. I don't mean that. What I mean is, is I'm, 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 I'm saying that within myself, within my ability, I will never be able to bring this out in the magnitude that, that, I, I, that I'd like to bring it out in. Of the importance and the way that Jesus Christ is just shoved to the side, not only in the lost world of people that's not been born again, but in Christians. Now to back up what I'm saying. Um, in, in Exodus. When God started dealing with Moses. On the way things must be. Now this was by chance. I'll just go ahead and tell you all the truth here. Because well. I'm a Christian and I should tell the truth. But this was March 1st. I don't know the year. But this was the very first sermon that I preached here at this church. And God gave it to me yesterday to go back over this sermon with you all again. And I'm not going to go into the, to the, to the detail that I did that day. Only thing I remember about that day is I was nervous as a cat on a hot, hot tin roof. I'm not saying I don't get nervous anymore, but that particular day I was really nervous. But I want to take you all back to Exodus and in, in, in it's in chapter, you don't have to turn there. It's way too much to go into detail on through the scripture today. But maybe sitting tonight, or since we don't, we're not going to have church tonight here, maybe sitting tonight, maybe turn to the book of Exodus chapter 25 and start reading about the tabernacle. The tabernacle was, was the way that God chose for Moses to set this thing up as they traveled through the desert. The tabernacle, tabernacle was to be the place of worship. It was going to be a rough sketch of what was soon to be the temple in Jerusalem. It was just a very rough sketch. It was like camping out. Uh, it's like living in a tent, so to speak. And, 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 and then you have a home at home that's nicer that you live in. It was just a rough sketch of it. But it was so much great detail in it. It would it, 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 take forever to go through it in a sermon. But the tabernacle, every part... Uh, of it, its coverings, the way it was built, and its sacred vessels, without exception, speak of Christ in either his atoning role or his media, mediatorial role or his intercessory role with us. Now, I know that's a mouthful, but his atoning role has to do with he, 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 he paid the price of all of our sins for us. He atoned for that. And, and, and all the all the vessels and, and most of the things in the tabernacle and even the courtyard around it. If you look up, you can look up what we think that the, uh, the courtyard and the tabernacle looked like back in them days. Jimmy Swagger, his, he, he has a book called The Tabernacle. And if you get that book and, and look at it, it shows uh, drawn pictures of what even the high priest and all the people looked like in their, in their attire and how they dressed and what they wore. And it shows the, the, the tabernacle of old. And it, it's awesome to see the work and the intelligence that was put behind making every one of these sacred vessels for the tabernacle. Now, why are you bringing the tabernacle up, Mark? Because I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get you to the point to see that if Jesus Christ is that important to God, His Father, our Heavenly Father, then don't you think He ought to be that important to us? Yes. He, he, paid a, he paid an awesome price for us, y'all. Yes. He paid an awesome price. To understand the tabernacle, you will, you will understand the Lord Jesus Christ more than ever before. If you'll, if you'll sit down and take time to study 
the makings and the, and, the, and the symbols and the types of what the tabernacle was, you'll start to understand Jesus more. And, and, and to understand Jesus more, then you'll understand God more. Because even Jesus said that I am like him and he is like me. Amen. So if you've seen one, you've seen the other. So it's important that we understand the character and the nature and the, and the awestruck splendor and wonder of Jesus Christ. I think that is so overlooked these days. We come to church and not necessarily here, but there's all kinds of churches that are in session right now. And I would dare to say not to be negative, not to offend anyone that may watch this after their service today. But I would dare to say that, the, but not in all, I'm not saying that there's not anywhere out there that's not doing this. But on the biggest picture, I dare to say that Jesus Christ is going to be lifted up the way he deserves. I don't think that it don't matter what your sermon's about. It don't matter the title of your sermon. It don't matter any of that. What matters is, is that you lift up the name of Jesus. Because if he not be lifted up, then he can't come be with us. He cannot send his Holy Spirit down. The Holy Spirit will not step around Jesus Christ and come anyway. If he's not glorified, magnified, and, and preached correctly, the, uh, the, the Holy Spirit cannot come. Yeah. And by the way, today is a simple title of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Who was Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Who was this, this poor peasant that we see as carpenter that we read about and we study and we, we raise our hands to in church services and we praise him. Who was he? Who was he? Well, the, the tabernacle of old will teach you who he was if you'll study it correctly. And there's all kinds of places in the Bible that will teach you. But I love reading about who Jesus was uh, through the tabernacle construction the tabernacle was meant to be a pattern for living given by God for the Israelites. No, that don't mean that we go back to, the, to that construction of, of the live for God. Now, Christ has already taken care of that. Everything that he stood for, uh, or let me rephrase that, everything that, that was a type of who he was in the tabernacle, he has fulfilled it because he's came. And he was buried and he rose again and now he's seated on the right hand side of the Father making intercession daily for us. Now when I say he makes intercession it used to be taught and I used to understand it that when he made intercession that when we would fail and, and we would mess up that God, the, that God the Father would see it and it would maybe, maybe prick him to anger a little bit. And then, and then he would look over at Christ and Christ would look at him and say no, no, Father, don't be angry with him. I'm, I'm here in their place. I'll stand in the gap before they fail. It don't work that way, folks. By him being seated, it means that it is a finished work. It means that that intercessory role that he plays for us is a constant flowing. It never ceases. It never stops. He don't have to look at God the Father. God the Father don't have to look at him. It's a constant flow, but there's one thing you must do. There's one thing as Christians we must do after we're saved is always remember to confess that sin. You will mess up. It's been taught and it's, been, it's being preached today that the grace revolution, and it's straight out of hell. The grace revolution says that once you ask for forgiveness on day one, so to speak, meaning that would be July 14th, of 2014 that was according to this teaching is that day that I did that that I was covered past yes that is correct my past was covered it was forgot about it was forgiven but this grace revolution teaches today that it also covers everything anything that you were to do after that in other words you don't have to ask for Forgiveness, that is a lie straight out of the pit of hell. Because let me tell you what, this book right here that I hold in my hand says that every unconfessed sin is an unforgiven sin. Amen. We must still go to our Father and say, God, forgive me for what I just did. Why? Because that teaches us discipline. Christ was the perfect example of discipline. There was nothing that he ever did 
There was nothing that he ever said that wasn't okay, so to speak, or brought to him without God the Father. He always looked to God the Father. When he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, every word that come out of his mouth wasn't, no, I ain't going to do that because I'm Jesus and you can't make me. No, every word out of his mouth, it come out of here because he said, not my will, but God's, my Father's will. I must stay in the will of my Father. If he was so adamant about staying in the will of his Father, don't you think it would be adamant for us to stay in the will of, his, of, of our Father? Glory to God. I was worried. I, I know I worry. It says not to worry in the Bible. How about I say it this way? I was concerned. I was concerned about today. I thought this ain't going to be very good. And I'm not bragging on myself when I say that it's going to be good. Because I just felt the Holy Ghost come in this place. Amen. You can't preach Jesus. You can't uplift Jesus and without the Holy Ghost showing up. So preachers, if you watch this after this service today, if you wonder why your churches are dead, if you wonder why your, your sermons ain't got no off to them, maybe it's because you're not uplifting the man. And that man is Jesus Christ. If you will get busy uplifting His name, He will come by His Holy Spirit and help you through these services. And your, and your congregation will get louder. Your congregation, it ain't about being loud, but your congregation will get louder. Your congregation will get more uh, full of joy and glory and start raising their hands and saying praise the Lord and hallelujah. We have a lot to praise the Lord about. Amen. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ has already taken care of all that. Like I said, Paul said in Romans 10, 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. When the Holy Spirit gave the words for the book of Hebrews to be written, tabernacle was used to the tabernacle was used to portray Christ, not the temple. Why? Why was the tabernacle of old in the book of Hebrews used as a as a portrayal of Christ instead of that big beautiful temple that Solomon ended up building that God gave David the instructions to build? Why was why was why did Paul in Hebrews and I believe uh, from what I've read and been taught I believe that that uh, the apostle Paul did write the book of Hebrews but why in the book of Hebrews did Paul write or the Holy Spirit through Paul use the tabernacle as a portrayal of Christ instead of the beautiful temple because it was it was for a simple reason that Christ come as an example for us. He did not come. Why do you think that the Bible does not talk about Christ in his person and who he was more than what it does? Because they, the, God does not want you to get wrapped up in, in that. He wants you to get wrapped up, tied up, and tangled all up in the reason that Jesus came. And the reason that he came was, was to set an example for us on how we should be. Humility. We must walk. Humility does not mean weakness. Humility is only to be portrayed in front of him anyway. It don't mean that you walk around with your head down and let people walk over you like a doormat. That is not the humility that the Bible's talking about. It's talking about humility before him. And I'll get into that momentarily. The temple was beautiful. Talking about the Solomon's temple as the Bible calls it. The temple was beautiful. It was the most costly building ever constructed. Listen to that. It was the most costly building ever constructed in human history. It was a beautiful, beautiful place. It portrayed the coming kingdom age when times will be a vast difference than now. That's what the tabernacle portrayed. It's going to be beautiful. Let me tell you. Let me give you a quick idea of what's going to happen one day. And I don't know if this is 100% correct or not, but I'll blunder through it real quick for you. But one day, that trump's going to sound. Amen. One day, those that are born again and those that have already died in Christ, they're going to rise first. And then we're going to rise behind them. And we're all going to have, just like the song says, we're all going to have a meeting in the air. 
in the head of that meeting. We're not going to be up there uh, uh, socializing with one another, I don't believe. I'm sure it's going to be glad we're going to recognize people that we see. But I don't, I tell you uh, what I feel like. I feel like it's going to be like that song. I can only imagine. I don't know what it's going to be like because the focal point is going to be on who? The focal point is going to be on Jesus. Can you imagine this day coming? Can you imagine we're all, when we all meet in the air and there's Jesus, the one we've preached about, we've taught about, we've prayed to, we, we, we've cried to, we've trusted Him. He said, ought to be there. And today, getting back into the root of my sermon, and I'll go on with, with that because I'm getting ready to hopefully get you excited here. But, uh, but, but today we see Christians, sinners especially, unbelievers, let's put it that way. Unbelievers, they don't pay no mind to Him. They don't have no idea that he's even, they don't, they don't even think about him. And I dare to say there's some Christians that don't think about him very much. There's some Christians, and I'm one of them. I'm not preaching to just y'all. I've always said I should, I'm going to get me one of them harmonica carriers that, you, that singers put on their neck, and I'm going to put me a mirror in front of it because I preach to myself sometimes, y'all. But we don't give Christ enough thought. We don't sit around, we don't ponder on Christ enough. He's the ultimate teacher. He's the ultimate rabbi, so to speak. There is no other shepherd. There is no other priest. He is the high priest. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He's everything in between. He is the brightest star in the sky, if you want to put it that way. He's the bright morning star. He's the rose of Sheridan. He's the lily of the valley. He is everything. And we I can dare say that most Christians go through the day and they don't ponder on how was Jesus? How does Jesus want me to be? We have things at our fingertips. Back when I was into working with horses pretty heavily, and we all know that, that God brought me down a different road there, and I won't go into that right now. But there was people that would come to me and would they, they would say that they really wanted to learn about horses. And I'm not uplifting myself here, but God gave me an innate uh, understanding of a horse years ago. And I don't mean a certain type or what, the horse itself. Just that God made creature called the horse. He gave me an innate understanding of it. And some of the things that I could teach people and some of the things that I would talk about in that type of world was gold. And it's not because I taught it or I said it. But I would catch people that were there to learn. They would be on their phones. They wouldn't be paying attention. And I would think, oh, if I would have only had this at my fingertips when I was learning about horses. Oh, it was precious. It would have been so precious to me. Well, I see Christians walking around and they're struggling. They're, they're, the devil's kicking them around and throwing them down and spitting them up and chewing them out. It's because they're not sitting around and they're not worried about what Christ was like. They're not digging into this book and finding out what the teacher says. They're not finding out what the character of Christ was. Enough. And the devil is taken over. He, we've got the ultimate teacher in Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Yeah. To them back in that day and from what we read today. He, he was. To them and to us now we see him as, as a poor carpenter. Well I'm here to tell you today. That's what he was. But that's not really who he was. He was God. He was the Son of God. When he, when he died and he rose again, it says that God gave him all power. And I put that word all in capital letters. All power. And one day, coming soon, after that rapture I just talked about, we're all going to go and we're going to have, we're going to have fun. We're going to have a good time in heaven. I don't know what we're going to be doing uh, other than praising him and saying holy, holy, holy every day with the creatures and the, and the elders around the throne. It's going to be wonderful. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk around. I'm going to find me a big old grizzly bear. I love him things. And I'm going to hug it. I'm going to ride it. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to, I'm going to get down and wrestle it. I know that sounds stupid, but we're going to be able to do things. that There's going to be so much fun. But then, after seven years go by, now you know what's going to happen, don't you? Where all of a sudden we're going to, now this is just Mark's version. I don't know if it's really going to happen this way. But we're all going to be sitting there and we're going to see Christ. And he's going to get up and he's going to start getting ready. He's going to put on that vesture. The Bible says it's a vesture that goes on his side that says the King of Kings. 
and the Lord of Lords. He's going he's gonna to throw himself up on that white horse. I can see it in my eyes now. I can, and we're all going to be playing. I'm going to be wrestling that bear. And all of a sudden, I'm going to look up and I'm going to say, oh, it's, it's time. And I, 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 think, I think we're going to hear, a, I think we're gonna hear a, a battle trumpet sound. And we're all going to, all of a sudden, horses are going to come from everywhere. And they're going to line themselves up in unison. And Christ is going to say, all saints. And that's who all is going to be there, by the way. Get on your horses. And I think we're going to travel in a, in a, in a, a supernatural way. I don't know how, but I sit and think about it all the time. And we're going to travel somehow through, 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 the, through, the, through the air, through, through the atmosphere, the universe. And we're going to come down and we're going to start coming down and getting closer to over in Saudi Arabia somewhere. That valley where the battle of Armageddon is taking place at that point in time. Well, at that point in time, the Israelites, they're going to think they're trapped. Every nation in the world, hopefully not America. That's why it's important that you get out and vote in November. But hopefully not America, but every nation in the world has come against Israel at this time. The Antichrist, he has revealed himself as, as who he really is. Three and a half years before that, it was perfect. It was nice for those here. Taxes went down. Prices got cheaper. Everybody was thinking he was the Messiah. But all of a sudden, three and a half years after that, he starts revealing himself. And now we've had three and a half years of nothing but horror. Nothing but if you don't accept this mark, you can't buy this. If you don't accept this mark, you can't go in this store. We're not worried about it. We're not going to have to worry about it because we're in heaven. But I'm just telling you what's been going on here on earth. And then all of a sudden, this battle is going to be taking place over there. And the Israelites are thinking that they're trapped. And all of a sudden... The can't TV cameras are going to turn. And I believe there will be TV cameras just like you see with Israel now and, and the other wars that we've had. I think the cameras are going to turn and that news broadcaster is going to get interrupted and he's going to say, but wait, what is that coming through the sky? sky? It says it's going to be like clouds and those clouds are going to be white horses. And in front of him, there's going to be a, a man Oh, glory, that stands out among all the other people behind him. And he's going to be in the lead. Nobody's beside him, on either side of him, and they definitely ain't nobody in front of him. He's going to have a crown on his head. He's going to have a sword on his side. And he's going to come down, and his foot is going to touch the mount of Olivet. And the moment that that happens, the, 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 the mountain's going to crack wide open. Glory to God. And the Israelites are going to escape, or the Jews are going to escape into there. And we're going to be right behind him. And it says that hailstones are going to come down as big as Volkswagens and help slew and slay the enemy, which is all those that turned against God. So this is the Jesus that I'm talking about. And we walk around here on earth today and we don't give him one iota of a thought through the day. Not much anyway. Not what he deserves. But the biggest thing I'm trying to get you to see is how we must be. We don't look to him on how we must be. We get all of these role models in our life and there's nothing wrong with looking up to people. You know, I wasn't raised, I, I wasn't given instructions as a boy. I was told that this was wrong, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this. You, you know, I was told the basic principles of life and that was it. But I was not sat down and told about this man Jesus the way he deserved to be told. I was not sat down and told, Mark, if you want to be a better man, then be more like Jesus. Read in this Bible and find out his character. And that's how you should portray your life. Amen. That excites me to tell about the, about the coming of Christ. Amen. The second coming. Everybody thinks the rapture is the second coming. He don't come to earth, so he's not come back. He hovers above earth, so that's not the second coming. The first coming is what we read about in here. The second coming is going to be the coming when he comes back to defeat the Antichrist. Just wanted to throw that in there because a lot of people think the rapture is the second coming, and it's not. It says, keep in mind, let me back up and say, but the tabernacle portrayed the redemptive process greater than anything else. That's why the Holy Spirit used this as an example of Christ. Keep in mind that the only way to God the Father is through Jesus Christ. 
I just saw on the side and I read it every time I come over here, up here right above Lee's Cargo, as you cut off that road to go to Brush Fork, right there on that telephone pole, the little yellow sign, and it's probably so overlooked, but it plainly says, I don't know who put it there, it's been there for years. It's a yellow and black sign that says, Jesus Christ is the way, Amen. the truth, and the life. Amen. That is such an awesome sign, even though it's just a little yellow sign with black lettering. If people would read that, and, and I don't know, I, I, I would dare to say that there, nobody's went by and read it. I would, I would like to think that somebody has went by and saw that and maybe the Holy Spirit started working on them. And they went home and they got in this book and said, I think I'll give my heart to Jesus today. You don't know. It's so important the things we say. It's so important the things that we do. It says, or, or, or I'm going to say the Holy Spirit said through me, because I don't take credit for these notes, that the tabernacle was all of God and none of man. Absolutely none. More space, but listen to this, more space was given in the Holy Bible for a detailed description of the tabernacle than anything else. That ought to answer your question, how important was Christ to God? Than anything else. Only two chapters was given for the portrayal of creating the earth. By comparison, some 12 chapters were needed to tell Moses about the tabernacle. Don't think that the tabernacle was just a record of Jewish manners uh, and customs, which have no meaning to us now. 2 Timothy verse uh, chapter 3 verse 16 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable so anything in this word I don't care if it's reading the lineage I don't know if y'all do or not but I've been tempted to and I probably have I'll just go ahead and be honest with you when it comes to back in the Old Testament and you see some of these lineages and it goes on for a whole page and a half and it's he begat this and he begat that read it even if you can't pronounce the name Everything in this book is profitable. What will you get out of reading them names? I don't know. You might come up with a name for your grandchild or something. Who knows? But every bit of it is profitable. Verse 3 speaks of, in Exodus chapter 25, speaks of gold. Gold was symbolic of, of his deity. Gold was symbolic of Christ's deity. Silver was symbolic of his redemption by death. Brass spoke of the judgment he would suffer on the cross for us all. In verse 4 of chapter 25 of the book of Exodus, it speaks of colors, all kinds of colors. Blue speaks of the fact that he came from heaven. Purple uh, represents his kingship. Scarlet represents the blood that was shed for all of humanity. Fine linen stands for his righteousness. Hides were laid across in order, uh, in order, linen first. When you walked into this tabernacle, it had walls that were built of shittim wood. Shittim wood was the most instructable wood that's ever, that God's ever made. And, and this tabernacle was made of shittim wood. That represented Christ being indestructible. And they overlaid them, them boards. It was just boards, just like, I don't know how they cut them. I have no idea. I'd like to go back and, and spy on them, if you could, if you will, uh, uh, for lack of better thought in my brain, and see how they cut all this stuff. But they were boards. God even gave the, the order on how wide the boards were to be, how thick the boards were to be. And they overlaid these boards. You know, I've built barns before. I built my barn. Everything at our house I've built. And I can just picture it now, those boards being uh, stood up. Side by side, just like you see buildings, old rough cut buildings being made outside now. And, but they overlaid them with gold. So you had the indestructible type of Christ inside that gold. And then you had gold on it, which spoke of his deity, his God, his, his overpowering uh, godliness, if you will. And this linen was laid across the tabernacle first. It was just four walls with a doorway at the front. Back wall, side walls, and the front front uh, end of it, and the front end of it had an opening in it to walk through. I'm trying to get you to see the process that was taken to build this tabernacle, and then these linens. How? Where did they get linen from in the middle of the desert? I have no idea. 
They made it. They made it some way out of out of out of hair, out of out of wool. I don't know where they got it from, but all this stuff was made right there in the desert. And they made these linens in the tabernacle. Well, it wasn't no small thing. The measurements are in here in the, in the Bible, and I didn't take time to write them down. But let's just say that it was a 30 by 30 by 50. I'm just going to don't quote me on that. Go find it for yourself. But let's just say that those, those measurements are right. 30 wide and 50 long. This square rectangular shaped uh, construction, this building. Well, those, those linens were laid across it, which means they had to be bigger than that structure. And they were laid across it to where they come out on the ground on each side. And it covered the back. And it covered the whole roof of it. As you walked in, that's what you saw. Was you saw that fine linen. That white linen that spoke of his purity. And then on top of that, uh, the linen was laid first. And then, and then goat's hair. Asian goats. Which had long, beautiful hair. Almost like silk. It was the great of great value and it spoke of his prophetic office so you had the linen that you saw when you walked in in between that was the goat's hair and then the very last there was three layers of skins or two layers of skins and the fine linen on top of the on top of the uh, goat's hair was badger skins was last looking from the outside that you <clears throat> looking from the outside that is what the world saw not very attractive, just like Christ being here as a peasant wasn't very attractive. But but the thing that baffles my mind is a badger is not a very big animal, and to make a and to make a a, a, a whole a whole sheet of badger skin sewn together would take a lot of badgers, and badgers are mean. Could you imagine God appointed whoever was appointed to go out and kill these badgers? Look, y'all, all this had to be done. Do you, do, do you follow me on the, 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 the construction of this tabernacle? And it all represented Christ. Amen. And we walk around on a daily basis and we don't give him a bit of mind. We don't try to sit down and find his character enough. Like I said, shite wood, beautiful, indestructible, and would not rot. There is nothing about Christ that has got anything to do with rot. That's why, I, that's why I'll never back up and I will never say that the water that he turned to wine was fermented. It was not the type of wine to get you drunk. It was, the, it was grape juice is all it was. And it was the sweetest grape juice that you could ever put to your lips, I'm sure. Because it was a miracle right there before. To make wine, you have to ferment it, which is a type of rot. It's a, it's a process of fermentation, which is rot. How could Christ... The perfect one, the pure, the pure one. How could he make anything that represented him? And that's what this grape juice that he created out of water was, was a representation of him. How could he, not having any rot, make something that had to be rotten to make it? That's why Paul said a little bit of leaven ruins the whole lump. He was talking about leaven, yeast. Yeast is a fungus. All the bread in the tabernacle, which I might get to here in a minute, had to be uh, free of leaven. It, could, it, could, it had not have any leaven in it because it represented Christ. And to get leaven, you had to get, it was yeast. And to get yeast was a fungus. It was a rot. Yeah. I will never back down on alcohol. Ever. I know what it was on the world. On the, I know the road that I was on with it. It was on, a, on an endless, destructive, destructive road. There is nothing about alcohol that's any good. You can hear some people say, oh, it's all in moderation. Well, you smile with your big cigar hanging out of your mouth, saying that with your wine glass or your little toddy of a, of a vodka and cranberry juice that evening if you want to. But there is nothing about alcohol that is pleasing to God. There is nothing about alcohol that needs to be in the Christian body. And I'll always stand up and say that. Verse 6 speaks of the oil for the lamp, for the light. It was olive oil. The Holy Spirit who rested on Christ above and beyond measure. Spices for sweet incense spoke of his, of his prayerful and constant intercession for the child of God at all times. They would bring those, they would bring those uh, uh, um, uh, little um, censers in there. They were little... T like T 
teapot looking things hung by chains and they, they bring coals from the from the brazen altar in there which was a type of Christ and they would pour them pour that incense over them hot coals and those sweet incenses would go up and it was it was a type of intercession for us and it was pleasing to God's nostrils Amen. everything in truth is in Christ of Christ by Christ with Christ through Christ and in fact is Christ and Christ alone I don't think y'all got that. I'm going to read it again. Everything in truth is in Christ, of Christ, by Christ, with Christ, through Christ, and in fact is Christ in Christ alone. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? God said in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is my, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hebrew 11, 5 through 6 says, God can only be pleased with you through faith in Christ, in Christ alone. There is nothing about you that pleases God. I'm sorry to break that news to you. But one thing. And that's faith in his son Jesus. Yes. It's not that we're all bad. I don't want you to go home with your head hung down and say I'll never, I'll never live up to Christ. That might be a pretty good thought because you won't live up to Christ. But we're not to get plumbed down on ourselves about that. I'm not trying to get you down on yourself. I'm just trying to tell you that Christ is so perfect. He is so holy. He is so pure. That that pureness and that holiness, there's nothing about us that would ever meet up to that. Amen. I know people right now, I've got family members that I do believe that they think that they're going to go to heaven on just their morals. Just being a good person. And these, these people, there's two that comes to my mind right now. They are good people. They would do anything for anybody. But if you're not blood washed, born again, and have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, bad, uh, good morals or not, I'm sorry to say if you die and you have not confessed your sins, this Bible tells me that you will go to hell. God cannot excuse it. He, he, he put it in stone before the foundations of the earth. And I'm about through. The brazen altar was seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four and a half feet high. This brazen altar is where they is where they would lay their sacrifices. The high priest, uh, Aaron's sons, and him, they would take that, that animal and they would slit its throat and they would let the blood drain. And then they would put this animal on this brazen altar. Now, a lot of people say that's cruel. You'll have some animal rights people out there that says you shouldn't preach that. You shouldn't do it. You shouldn't talk about it. They shouldn't have done it back then. Well, let me tell you, if you feel that way, you're arguing with God. It was God's, it was God's divine way. It was his prescri prescribed order because Christ hadn't came yet. And for every sheep that died, oh, he can miraculously replace it with another. You shouldn't doubt God in what he said. Three cubits high, the number three spoke of the deity of Christ. God said to make it four square means the same gospel, south, east, north, and west. Four square, we, we, he was to make that tabernacle. It was not to be, it was, for, it was for be, to be for all humanity, not just some. Even those people walking around, dancing around over there. I seen them little boys on a show here a while back. They were over there. And they would have the little towel around them or a little, little piece of cloth. That's all it covered their, their total nakedness. Little boys about Jesse Ann's age, five, six. Let me see, Jesse Ann's age. Sorry, sissy. All over there, and they had sticks, and they were sticking them up in them bees' hives and getting honey out and licking it off in sticks. And them bees were all over, stinging them. You can see them, they hit yourself every now and then. Tough little dudes, let me tell you. But even those people, Trying to get you to see that this great gospel right here and what Jesus Christ did for us is for them too. Amen. And it says in this book, and that's why I support and follow Jimmy Swaggart Ministries so much, is because they're doing their best to get this gospel into every part of the world. Even over there. Even over there, there's people that come. There's preachers that come in some of them foreign countries. I can't think of the countries now. This ought to wake you up. This ought to make you go home and grab a hold of this book and hold it to your heart and carry it with you wherever you go, symbolically speaking. 
But there's there's videos of, and stories of these me and these preachers over there. They got two or three pages, and that's it, ripped out of the Bible. That's all they got. And they preach the word on them two or three pages for years. And then all of a sudden, here comes this truck, this cargo truck backing up. And all these expositor Bibles are being passed out to among them preachers. And they're grabbing them and they're holding them. And they've got their hand up and they're praising God. They finally got a whole Bible. Amen. And ours lay on the coffee table. And with drink uh, stains on, rings on, where we lay our drinks on. I'm not saying y'all were necessarily sitting in here. I mean, but biggest part of, of people. We don't, we don't cherish this book. I just told you that in, in the first part there, the, the, in the uh, ch first chapter of John, that the Word is Him and He is the Word. I see people, this sorrowness that come over me yesterday when I started studying for this, it overwhelmed me so much. I told you I had to go lay down on the bed I had to examine myself laying there. Do I think enough about Christ? Do I try to, 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 to let Him teach me? Do I try to let Him sanctify me through His Holy Spirit enough? What Christians are doing today and preachers are preaching, they're preaching uh, uh, salvation by Christ and Christ alone. And that is wonderful and good. But then they turn around and they try to teach sanctification by self. You cannot sanctify yourself. There's no way. If you could do that, then there was no need for Christ to do what He's done. There's no need for this Word if you could sanctify yourself. Sanctification means perfect. We are to strive to be perfect, knowing that we never will be until we get our glorified bodies. But our every day, I get tired of hearing Christians say, oh, we all make mistakes. We all fall short. Yes, we do. Even Paul said that. We all fall short. We sin daily. I understand that. But wake up, folks. It's time that we get uh, on the battlefield. It's time that we wake up and we start thinking to ourselves, I am going to be perfect today. Amen. Praise God. But in the back of your mind, know that you can't be. Now, I know that sounds like a, I think you call that an oxymoron or something. I have to look that word up later. I don't even know where it comes from. Sounds like you're calling somebody a moron. But... I'll have to look that word up to make sure I'm using it correctly. But that, that's like, why would you even think that? Why would you think to do something and in the back of your mind know that you won't be? It's called discipline. God wants us to discipline ourselves and be as perfect as we can be. And when we make that mistake, stop right there. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your heart if the atmosphere around you don't allow you to say it out loud. And just ask Him to forgive you. Say, God, I stumbled. I failed. And you know what? He's not running behind you with a belt in his hand. With it drew back. With the gritted teeth. And a wrinkle in his brow when you mess up. I'll, you know what he's doing? He's walking around behind you with his arms out. Saying, just turn to me. Turn to me, son or daughter. This is why I died. Amen. Turn to me and just ask me to forgive you. I don't know if I'm making sense today. This is probably one of the, uh, I ain't going to say weirdest, but the most um, winging it by the Holy Spirit sermons that I've ever done. I usually got a bunch of notes here and I follow along, but all this is just flowing in me. I can, I'm going to let y'all go here momentarily, but I can sit here and I can just keep going on and on and on about Jesus Christ. On how important it is to wake up daily and make Him your, 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 your goal to figure out and to study on who he was. I've got, I've got one more scripture I want to read you. And it's in, it's in Luke 17. This ought to be a pretty good example. Luke 17, verse 11. And it says, It came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And, he, and as he entered into a certain village, there met him... Ten men who were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priest. And it came to pass as they it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, 
when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering him said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? That's what we're doing on a daily basis, and we don't realize it sometimes. And God uses big mouth preachers like me to get up here and remind myself and you that we were lepers at one time. We were filled. We were rocked. We were dying and going to hell. And Jesus, in a symbolic way, turned around and he said that you're clean. You've been forgiven. That disease, that rock of sin that was on you the day you were born is now you're cleansed of it. And again, that don't mean you're perfect. But how many of us forget on a daily basis and we walk through life not giving Christ the right homage, so to speak, if you would, the right praise, the right glory, the right everything. I encourage you today to do that. I encourage you to wake up every day and tell God, God, I want to be more like you. Jesus, I want to be more like you. Teach me how, Jesus, to be more like you. Woman or man, it goes for both. Well, how can a woman learn to be like a man? Because he didn't come here and be a representative of just the, the gender male. It was for both female and male. It's the character. It's the personality. It's the things that you're supposed to take on after him. Not, not his actual walk, the way he looked when he walked. Not his actual talk, the way he sounded when he talked. Not his actual uh, uh, mannerisms, the way he laughed. We'll never know that. That's not the, what God's wanting us to do. He's wanting us to take on that inner, that inner being that Christ was. And I hope that makes sense today. Amen. I thank you for sitting and listening to me blunder through this. Mm -hmm. I hope that it goes home. And I hope that, you, that the Holy Spirit works on you with it the same as he worked on me. It wasn't a shallow mm -hmm. down, shallow down to the floor sermon. But if we all can just figure out how to make ourselves, and let me rephrase that, we'll never make ourselves, how we can allow the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to make us more like Christ. Mm -hmm. It will be an awesome thing. As Burgundy comes and displays something soft just for a minute or two, you never know that of someone that may be needing to pray. I ask every head to bow and every eye to close. I ask you if you're sitting here today, if there's anything that you need to come to this altar for and make things right, you don't necessarily have to come to an altar. You don't have to get up. God will meet you wherever you're at. But sometimes he wants us to step out. He wants us to show that boldness that we have, that, that endeavor to, to get up and come forward in the name of Jesus and admit that we need help. It's that humility, it's that humbleness before him that sometimes he wants us to come and bow ourselves down. But I ask you, if there's someone here today that's not totally 100% right with him, and you feel it in your heart that somewhere that you've either done something that, that he didn't forgive. There's not a sin that he won't forgive. But let me tell you, an unconfessed sin is an unfor uh, unforgiving sin. So if you search your heart sitting here, by the way, of watching on the internet, and you, and, you, and you come to the conclusion that you have something that you need to make right with him, do it now before it's too late. I'm not saying that that one thing can keep you from heaven. That's not my place to say God's grace is big. But that one thing may keep you from growing in Him. And to grow in Jesus is what we all are striving to do. So I ask you today, if that be you, come forward. Come forward and just speak to Him, talk to Him. I'll come meet with you. I can't forgive you, but I can sure pray with you. And I'd be more than glad to. Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord, in the name of this man that I just so, so earnestly tried to lift up, your son Jesus. God, we come to you in his name. God, we ask you, Lord, God, to keep flowing, keep that grace.
grace flowing from you, Lord, and that mercy and that long suffering that I know personally I need. And God, teach us all how to be more like you. God, let us let us think about you more through today. Let us keep our mind on you and our mind off of what we got to do. God, because we know that things are not as important as you. God, I ask you again to be with all the sick that we have here in the church. God, be with all the sick that we have of people we don't know. God, I ask you to deal with the unsaved, whether it be friends or family or people we don't even know. I ask you to deal with them in their hearts and give them that good old Holy Ghost conviction that they'll give their heart to you. I ask the Lord that if there's anybody here today that struggles with things, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, nicotine, alcohol, immorality in their heart, God, I ask you, God, to, to deal with them in their heart, Lord, and teach them that victory for all the things has already been won by you and what you did on Calvary's cross. All they have to do is reach out and take it. God, we love you today. Go with us through this day. Lead, guide, and direct. 